Welcome to Cassandra Lunch number 44. Um, what, as I just mentioned, uh, we're going to look at Cassandra on Kubernetes um, and continue going through the fundamentals. We will take a look at a few of the Cassandra-related um, operator projects um, and uh, look at them and compare them. Um, before we do that, let's start the meeting. We uh, are a community, and I'm an organizer here, uh, but we're always looking for new organizers. Um, organizers get to meet people and you know, it's easy, I think, for us on the data engineering lunch, which happens on Mondays, uh, because a lot more people do data engineering than, than Cassandra. But if you're new to Cassandra or anything around Cassandra, even if it's like using Spark and Cassandra, Kafka and Cassandra, and you want to do a presentation on something you're learning, uh, that's great too. In fact, many of our other speakers um, learn, the, learn something new, they write a blog post on it, and they present it. And it's great for their career and, and their personal branding. And that's that's great for us as a community because now we're learning something that we didn't know before. We are part of a diverse group of meetups, one of many. Uh, what we cover here, we cover things related to Cassandra Wire Protocol. What's the Cassandra Wire Protocol? There's two aspects of it. One is the um, how do you connect to Cassandra and get data um, and the format of the data and all that stuff. And the other is how do those nodes, how do nodes talk together? That that is probably internal uh, protocol, which um, we don't really get into, but we may. There are many techniques that that are compliant with the wire protocol um, that are not running under the hood. They're not running Cassandra. They're just using some other uh, engine. So we're okay with that. And then there's another technology set that's written in C++, which mimics Cassandra called Scylla. Um, anyways, we have yet to have somebody speak on that. Um, normally at this time, we ask people that are new to introduce themselves. Anybody want to just say hi? It's their first time at this uh, Cassandra lunch meetup and how, you know, how you use Cassandra or what you want to get, what you want to learn. All right. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. Um, group rules, you have a question, just ask it, be polite, share with us what you know. Um, we're an aunt. We help professionals and teams build global scale real-time data platforms. That's a mouthful. Um, DataStax is a partner, so is GW University. We have some local, local sponsors in the DC and metro area, DC and Chicago metro area, as, do, as we also have some organizational sponsors uh, for Data Community DC. Um, I'll wait for the announcement. So are there any announcements for this group, Cassandra Lunch? Anything related to Cassandra or DataStax or Scylla? in terms of events, you know, um, related, but not really. There's a data week DC that's coming up. Just want to give you guys the URL. Oh, yeah. DC. yeah. Um, so it's, it's a little ways off, but if you have something to talk about, uh, um, you know, um, then we're happy to, you know, Put you on the event. <laughs> There's no no events in there right now. Um, cool. Cassandra uh, events. Uh, this is weekly. Um, Cassandra lunch every week, same time, same place. And there's also a data engineers lunch that happens on Mondays. Um, you can check us out on uh, a not US events. Let's see what do we have coming up. We have if this thing ever comes up. So next week, Cassandra Lunch, we're going to do Alpaca, Cassandra, and Twitter. Um, basically, how to make a streaming application using uh, ACA um, to take, basically, scrape Twitter using Twitter API and putting it into Cassandra. Um, and then uh, you were doing this right now. OK, well, those are the Cassandra related stuff. Uh, if you want uh, every um, meetup around Cassandra, if you look for the Cassandra Lunch on GitHub, um, you know, we blog post every single event, all the notes. Uh, generally, there's a slide share uh, and a YouTube link. So it's all here. Right? If you want to catch up, there's 44 Cassandra lunches for you to catch up on. 
and they're also on YouTube, as, as I mentioned. And you can also find resources on consider.link, uh, the world's best Apache Cassandra knowledge base outside of data stacks. <laughs> um, cool. So let's do a review of um, the, you know, Cassandra on, um, oops, wrong. I already know how to do this. There we go. So quick thing, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. Um, containers are a way to host services on a infrastructure without having to have a different operating system per service. That's what we do with virtual machines. In a container world, there's one operating system. There's a container management service like, like Docker is one. Um, um, and then and, and we also use Kubernetes, um, which can use Docker as a, as a service, uh, daemon service, or it can use something else. Um, there are different types of containers, um, but essentially a container is now, a, when we say container, it's an image that is, it's a binary file that you can build locally and host locally, or you can push it to a registry. And um, if you're never gonna use many, many servers, you never have to talk to a public registry. But if you use something like Kubernetes, you're bound to be using um, different containers and it's just better to push it to a registry. So registry is optional, but people use them. Uh, containers are built basically like almost like classes that inherit from parent classes. Uh, you, you start with scratch, you add uh, what you want to add to it. Certain commands make this into Alpine uh, Linux container. Certain commands to install Nginx would make it a uh, Nginx uh, image. And then how you know, you're installing PHP and WordPress um, on there and running WordPress would be uh, making it a WordPress image. And what people do is they make Docker files, they build it, right? And they can happen locally on their, on their computer or the Docker host could be elsewhere. Why am I going through this stuff? Because we're gonna be looking at Docker files for Cassandra and how does it relate to Kubernetes? And uh, I want you guys to see what does that look like, right? If you wanted to customize your Cassandra instance on Kubernetes, more than likely you're gonna be customizing a Docker file because that's the most accessible way to make a container image. Um, so Kubernetes, uh, you know, high level, we, we have what's called a, a, a control plane, which has at least one master node. And then there are uh, servers called, uh, worker servers called nodes, which uh, basically represent a pool of resources. To make this highly available, you can have multiple master nodes, okay? Uh, I'm not gonna go deeper into this, but uh, essentially, all the commands that make changes to the cluster are done through the API and the kubelet command line tool that you use basically runs commands against this right here. All right, uh, what does a wor worker node have? Um, well, a worker node doesn't really have anything, but it, it runs something called kubelet and kproxy, which um, allow it to um, know the changes happening on the control plane and, and start pods um, and also be able to direct traffic using the proxy internally from like a, a high level you know, no, load balancer on other pods. Um, what is a pod? Pod is a set of containers. So like you can have a pod that just runs your microservice written in Java, Scala, Python, Go, whatever you name it, right? It would be like this. It's just a stateless service. You could have um, a pod that has a node API or another microservice, and then you can run, let's say MySQL in there. And then the data for that MySQL would be saved on a volume. So that pod basically is a collection of the volume and that microservice. Or you could have a combination of several volumes and uh, other containerized apps, microservices, even a web UI, um, and the reason it's called a pod is that when you need to scale this, this pod scales with all of the components inside the pod. That's important because Cassandra has state, it has data. So that data has to go somewhere. So when we say, I want four replica, uh, I want four nodes, 
right? What does that mean? That means that wherever there's another node, you have to reserve some space for that node. Because if it goes down and comes back up, we want to be able to get access to that data. Otherwise, what good is this container management if we lose all the data, right? Uh, and so this all this idea of, of state state inside Kubernetes is relatively new, about a year old. It's called stateful set. Before then, it wasn't as easy to run databases on on Kubernetes. Um, all right. There are once you know what a pod is, uh, there are different types of pods, which we will call like a workload. Um, Deployments, actually technically all of these are, are potential deployments, but deployment at the, at the core is just a simple pod and you can have multiple containers in it that talk to each other and it scales as you uh, expand. Um, a stateful set has a container to run the service itself, but then it uses a concept of a volume, a persistent volume to store the data. Uh, daemon set, you can run on the node itself, right? And it, it probably never needs to scale because it's just running as a background service. It's helping uh, the operate the, 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 the platform architect and operators. It helps them maybe collect information about what's happening or um, you know, running uh, basic metric collection and sending it to Grafana, things like that. Um, it's, just a, it's just a service that you're running that's not a highly critical service. It's just something that is helping you run the whole platform. Similarly, when you have uh, a job or a cron job, um, you can say, hey, deploy this job. It will run and it will be done. You can also have a cron job. So deploy this cron job with this cron syntax and it will have a recurring task. So you know, if you're using Cassandra Medusa to do your uh, backups, or if you're using Cassandra Reaper to do your backups, um, Cassandra Reaper is for repairs, excuse me. Cassandra Medusa is for backups. Um, if you're not using those and you want to do your own node tool cleanup and node tool repair and you know, node tool snapshot, well, you can you can take what you were doing with shell scripts and have that, you know, which you used to have on a, a on a cron job, you can make that into a container that predictably runs that task on as many nodes as you want, right? On and as many containers as you want. All right, so we talked a little bit about uh, you know Helm charts, but we really didn't um, you know go deep into what does a Helm chart look like. Um, so we'll take a look at, uh, at what a Helm chart looks like. Um, Helm chart basically allows us to take the complexities of like a really full application, right? which is a set of containers, sorry, a set of pods, and it makes it easy to just run it and deploy it easily. But Helm under the hood is actually using either, you know, pre-configured Kubernetes uh, resources, or it actually can install new resources that you need to, in order to do things. So we're gonna look at Cassandra operator. A Cassandra operator actually uses existing resources to run Cassandra. But then there's a Helm chart called Kate Sandra that uses the Helm uh, uses the Cassandra operator to then start up different things. And you know why would you use an operator, or why would you do it manually versus why would you use Helm? Um, my reasoning is always learn the basics, always understand how to deploy things manually on Docker, then on Kubernetes, then learn the operator then learn Helm because when shit hits the fan with Helm and you look at your Kubernetes logs, you don't know what's happening, right? But if you started with the bottom up and you learn all these things, then, then a Helm failure won't be a catastrophe. It will be a Kubernetes failure that you can then resolve, okay? Um, there's plenty of Helm charts out there. You go to helm.sh, um, Basically, any um, major software, open source, or even sometimes commercial that you're looking for, you can uh, you can find it. So, let's see: Cube, Prometheus, Stack, Jenkins, um, Console, Vault, um, Sumo Logic. Um, I mean, I, I want I want some volunteers. So, tell me some software that you guys run 
and see if there's a Helm chart for it. All right, Sunny, anything that you're curious about if there's a Helm chart? Sorry, I was on mute. Uh, sorry, I joined a little late, so no questions from my side, at least as of now. Okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll, it's, it's okay. So let's just look for Cassandra, right? So somebody has made um, a, a chart for Cassandra, and we can take a look at it. Um, there's also a Reaper operator published by Kate Sandra. Uh, there's a CAS operator chart published by Kate Sandra. So Kate Sandra is actually a collection of several charts, right, that make it possible to run uh, a large scale uh, system uh, involves Cassandra. So there's at least Cassandra on here, but what about, God forbid, Mongo? <laughs> um, there's a Mongo and ex ex Express. Um, admin interface that's already created. Um, there's a MongoDB that's created. So anytime you're looking to do things at production scale, you know, learn all the basics, but see if there's a their Helm chart that you can start from because somebody's already done the hard work of making it all work together. Um, so if you have a Helm chart, all you do is install this chart. That's all you do. And it will do everything to create a cluster. Now, there are settings that you can change. Um, and you definitely need Kubernetes. The host uh, has to have the kubectl command and the Helm command. Um, and you know, the, there has to be some way to like get uh, um, a disk attached to it for the persistent volume. But other than that, that's it. All you got to do is run that. If you didn't have the Helm chart, uh, you'd have to do a little bit more work. We'll take a look at that. Um, so we went through Docker to Kubernetes to what is uh, Helm. So now we're going to dig deeper into Docker file for Cassandra. Because if you don't have a Docker, if you don't have a container for Cassandra, this stuff doesn't work, right? So if I look for Docker file Cassandra, this is the most popular one. Uh, although it's not the of official, official one that Apache releases. Um, but if you were to run uh, Cassandra on Docker, all you do is Docker pull and then say Docker run Cassandra. It will run something for you. Um, let's take a look at the beta four, right? So a little tiny for you guys. There we go. So this Docker file says, start with, start with, the adopt open JDK image. Okay, well, you know what? Let's go up the tree. Let's see what that is inheriting from. All right, so this is, uh, it's actually using one of the other ones like focal here. I'll do the exact one, right? So we make sure we're using the exact one. What is this using? So maybe it's not in there. It's fine. I'll just use the open. Um, no. I'll just use this one. Okay. So adopt open JDK is basically the, um, the container. Um, if we take a look at the Docker file for this, where to go? I'm sorry. Official image. Nope, I'm missing something. Where is the tag? Oh, there we go. We'll take a look at, let's say the, the AMD one. Um, right. Sorry, they're being, where the heck is the Docker file for this? Sometimes people don't, um, here we go. Maybe this is it. It might be under the tags too. Here we go. They, they hit a limit apparently, right? Look at this. They hit a limit on the number of tags. So they couldn't publish it there. Fine. Um, here's the one that's probably closest to this. Uh, so this Docker file, where does it inherit from? So this inherits from Ubuntu 
version 20. Okay, so let's take a look at that. Why am I doing this? Because eventually when you're becoming like a master at Kubernetes, you have to become a master at Docker. And being a master of Docker means that you understand how this stuff is built. So what we're doing is we're going up the chain. We're saying, okay, well, well let's take a look at the Ubuntu Docker file and see how that's built. And so Ubuntu colon 20 is not a good search term. This is hubs, uh, hub, hub.docker.com not really being a great search engine. Um, but it, you, know, you can find what you're looking for. So let's take a look at Ubuntu. So Ubuntu's Docker file for 2004. It gets it from scratch. Scratch means this is the top. This Docker file builds the core Ubuntu image. And the way it does it is it, it adds a big fat tarf tar it in there, right? And then it goes and um, runs some basic uh, commands to get, um, you know, you need to have bin, for example, um, and that's probably part of it, but it, it starts up some basic um, things that you need in order to run this service. And uh, let's see if it does any uh, tar GZ. It probably just un it probably just unzips it and then um, and runs it. That's it. So we looked at Ubuntu. We now look at OpenJDK. So what is the OpenJDK one doing? Well, OpenJDK is saying, you know what? Install these things for me. Okay, install these things using apt-get. Um, and then it's setting some architecture environment variables that it basically gets the, the OpenJDK binary and tars it, untars it and makes it available. So then when, what does Cassandra do? Cassandra comes along and says, okay, I'm on Ubuntu. I have OpenJDK. Let's get started. Let's get this show on the road. So then Cassandra adds its users. It installs the prerequisites, right? And then finally, after setting some environment variables, it says, you know, it, it gets it from the internet, downloads it, um, creates a volume. It needs a place to put its data, otherwise it can't run. Um, and then it just starts Cassandra. So if you wanted to customize this Cassandra container, what you could do is you could say, from Cassandra, right? And then you can add more things to it. And so what would happen is that at the very end, if you put CMD, it would end up doing that. But, you know, I, sometimes these things run and then you're trying to run something else after that in, in an inherited container, there, there may be some issues. So if you want to customize your Docker file, probably just like fork this build it and see if it works for you. Then try inheriting it um, locally and running it. And if it works, then you can just inherit it globally. You can just inherit from Cassandra and make it work. Um, th this part of the customization for Dockerfile, I haven't had to do because essentially there are environment variables for what's the home directory for Cassandra and what is the configuration directory for Cassandra. So as long as I mount, etc Cassandra as a volume in the container and I give it the proper config files, this thing is going to do what I want it to do. I don't really need to customize this beyond that, right? Because whenever I bring Cassandra on a machine, the only thing I do is I give it some environment variables and I give it some con files and YAML files, uh, properties files, and that's what makes Cassandra run. Okay, so that's the customization of Cassandra at the Docker level. Once you're happy with your cont container uh, image, what it does, then you kind of have to go to the next level of doing it uh, either with Docker Compose. So Docker Compose, Cassandra, if you look for it. Ah, actually, this, this makes sense. They actually have an example for you on uh, the Bitnami Cassandra one. So, it says, hey, take a look at this and 
just do Docker Compose on. So this is Docker Compose. Now they're using the, the Bitnami Cassandra version, but you could just say image Cassandra colon 4.0, right? And it basically says, I want to override my data volume with my folder, okay? Um, which is, this is your, your kind of local driver. Go, uh, go to this and, and, and put the data here. Um, Cassandra Seeds, in this case, it has only one node right here, right? Um, and that's it. This is a very simple Docker Compose. But if I wanted to do a three node Cassandra cluster, you can also look for that for Docker Compose. See, if you know what to look for, you can basically get anything from, from the internet. Um, so here's a simple one. It's saying, hey, use the latest Cassandra Docker container. This is basically the, the one that, that Docker publishes as its official one, right? Here's my data. Um, here's my seed. And let's see, we have, we have the name of the cluster, what data center am I in, and what property file snitch am I using? So these are environment variables that you can look at uh, to say, what, what can I actually change? Um, and then it basically goes and, you know, uh, it mounts Cassandra data one, right? Cassandra data two, because each volume is different for each of the nodes. So now you're starting to see, like, if you're going to do Cassandra with Docker on one computer, you basically have to define the configurations for it for each of the nodes. So can you imagine that you're going to go do this on Kubernetes? So Kubernetes is way more complex. It's, I mean, it's, it's way more complex. It's just not even the same. But hopefully over time, it becomes easier. Um, but by the way, this, um, this Docker Compose, unless you're using Docker Swarm, which is, I think, basically getting uh, kicked out or it'll get merged into some sort of Kubernetes version, um, you can't scale this on multiple computers. Docker Compose only works on one computer. So right now, your only major option to run Cassandra at scale with containers is basically using um, like something like AWS Elastic Container Service, which come to think of it, I don't think it can, you still have to use something else. You still have to, uh, I have to double check, but you can't do it unless you're using Kubernetes right now. Somebody can tell me I'm wrong and I'll happily accept that if they can you know, tell me. But nobody's going to use some other rando technology to run Cassandra at scale because Kubernetes is the de facto cloud neutral orchestration platform. There's no other better one out there. So I'm giving you all this background information because, again, you're going to come into a situation where you're going to wish, like, where, why do we do it this way? Or, you know, what, you know, what is the big deal about? this image and what is the big deal about the volume and the environment variables? Because when you look at the, the simplest elegant solution right now, which involves a Helm chart, they have baked all this stuff into it so that you don't have to worry about it. They've put the intelligence of like a Cassandra architect into the Helm chart. I'm not gonna say it replaces a Cassandra architect, I'm just saying that it, it takes a lot of the intelligence required to run a, a large scale cluster and it puts it into the Helm chart. So we looked at the container for Docker. Now we looked at the Docker Compose. Let's look at what Cassandra looks like on on pure Kubernetes. Right. This is the Kubernetes direct um, tutorial. Right. So it says you got to use, uh, you know, stateful set, right? Uh, what's the goal? Create and validate a headless service, use a stateful set, and right, that's it. Now, you can run these examples. Uh, by the way, I'm going to put this link in here, but all this stuff will eventually go to the blog post as well. Um, but you can play with Kubernetes without having installed Kubernetes, right? So here's one. You can say start the scenario, 
and they're going to make us a little Kubernetes environment. Isn't that cool? Right? Here's a control plane. Here's your host. So if I put kubectl cluster dash info, come on, work, 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 please work. <laughs> um, oh, you know what? Maybe I have to run this. Control plane started. Um, maybe I have to run this as well. Anyways, I'm not going to start it for you. You guys can figure this out. But you can start a Kubernetes cluster and play around with this stuff. Uh, the other one is a little bit different. It's called playwithkates.com. Um, and you can start multiple machines, not just two nodes. And they give you four hours to play around with this stuff. So like you see how it says add new instance? It's making a computer for you. It's making another computer for you. It's making another computer for you. So um, anyway, it gives you, uh, you know, how to do it, how to set up a Kubernetes cluster, which is, which is a pain in the neck. But you want to learn how to do it, go for it. Um, so you got yourself a cluster to start Cassandra without any operator, you know, a one node Cassandra uh, cluster. This is what you do. It looks very similar to a Docker Compose file because it's, you know, it's basically the um, the equivalent in Kubernetes is this service, uh, you know, deployment using um, you know the Cassandra image, and to validate it, you see it's running. Um, now, to to continue adding nodes, right? You got to add some containers. So, in this case, we have how many? We have one node, so it looks a lot complicated, right? You got you got yourself here, your storage. Um, then you have your volume claim template because you may have more than one node, um, and you have Cassandra running three times. And the reason it's able to run three times is because it's using a persistent volume claim and a persistent volume using this template. So each node gets a persistent volume claim talking to your persistent volume. So this is Cassandra on Kubernetes, vanilla Cassandra on vanilla Kubernetes, nothing special. Okay. And you can clearly see that this is a stateful set. Okay, so what's the big deal? This isn't that difficult. Let's take a look at CAS operator. So CAS operator and CAS cop are the most mature um, Cassandra operators out there. Um, and if you um, want to build a production grade Kubernetes cluster, more than likely you would use CASCOP. Um, and then CAS operator is becoming the community version of the operator. And so people from the Orange Telecom CASCOP team is they're merging stuff into the um, CAS operator. Right. And that that project is called CAS operator. If you go to Apache dot or sorry, Cassandra.apache.org, um, You'll see updates from yours truly um, on, on the Cassandra Kubernetes project. I think it's up now, but there was a recent update that was published. Um, it may still be in the queue. Um, I, I think it's still in the queue because they're trying to drum up uh, a lot of um, you know, publicity for this Cassandra World Party, which I'm speaking at, by the way. Go take a look at it. Um, so CAS operator. What does a CAS operator do for us? If our startup of, of Cassandra looks like this without CAS operator, what would this look like if we had CAS operator? So we have Datastax's own um, documentation. So it says, hey, you know, go ahead and, and start this using this manifest. Okay. 
and you but you need to have your commands uh, ready to go. So it says run this thing, set up some major stuff in your cluster, get the storage ready, right? And then start the start the cluster. And then this is an alternative where it uses data stacks instead of Cassandra. Okay, so it's one file that, that it's using. Okay, so let's take a look at the, the one file. So you gotta have the CAS operator, oops, did not wanna do the whole thing. You have to have this as a prerequisite. And what this is doing, this is your operator, by the way. <laughs> it's huge. Okay. What is this doing? What is the, all this crap? This is the best practices of Cassandra put into an operator. Right? So that then you can leverage the in, intelligence that I was mentioning earlier to make a simple cluster and you can know that it's using some of the best uh, tooling. So I don't care for this cluster right now. We'll, we'll do that when we do the hands-on example uh, later. That'll be, that'll be part three. So this is your operator. It installs it. Okay, so I've got an operator. Now what? Well, I wanna put, put you gotta have storage, right? If you don't have storage, then you can't have Cassandra. So let's see how it's doing it. So this is an example from Google Kubernetes engine but there are equivalent um, storage set up for like your local computer, right? You can use your local storage for your local computer. Um, and then finally, after we have operator installed, after we have storage installed, let's take a look at the minimal Cassandra installation. Note that we're still not using Helm yet. We're just using kubectl commands. And here we go. So the Cassandra operator adds this object type, this custom resource definition inside Kubernetes. And that's what gives you like a superstructure object to give parameters, right? Before, there's very low level object. I have a container. It has these environment variables. To set up a data center, I need to say one, two, three, Right, but with this, it has more intelligence. This is a data center that has not only um, Cassandra, it has things like the metrics collector for Apache Cassandra, the management API for Apache Cassandra. These are things that are bundled into this, okay? Um, there's another file that it says, if you wanna look at the full file, Here's where you can define everything. It explains everything to you. JVM options. What things do you want to overwrite in your Cassandra YAML? Um, which version do you want to use? So with this one file, right? In this case, you have a, a number of server nodes. This is different. Um, could be different for you. You can make, that, make this into 60 and it will just scale it for you. But this is the only one file you need to scale your whole cluster. You're not gonna have to manage 60 different Cassandra files. You're not gonna have to manage Ansible to then like do a search in your place and update this thing, right? All of this is done with this one file. Still, there's another level of abstraction that can help you run Cassandra on Kubernetes and that's Helm. And the Helm chart we're going to take a look at is Kate Sandra. Kate Sandra is a collection of Helm charts. Um, we're going to look at just the Cassandra one. Um, but you know, how do we start uh, Cassandra uh, with um, Kate Sandra? Let's understand first what does it include? Well, it includes Cassandra using the, the operator that I just showed you. It has these two other um, containers for running the metrics collector and um, management API. It has Prometheus operator to gather data. It has a Grafana dashboard to look at what's happening. 
So it has all these bells and whistles uh, and, and uh, Cassandra Repair using uh, uh, Cassandra Reaper it has all these things ready to go so that you don't have to worry about it. And all you need to do is to have Kubernetes running, right? Um, make sure you have some storage, right? Got some storage. Um, and you just apply this. This is to run it on your local machine. If you're running it on your local Kubernetes uh, node. So this whole thing, this Helm chart, um, sorry, this is not Helm chart. Let me double check here. This creates all of the, um, uh, the services that you need. Um, the Helm stuff is actually here. There you go. So. Once you do this, you can just run this command. Start this cluster. And you're done. Okay. And the, and the file that you change is similar to the manifest that we were looking at earlier, but it has a few things like Stargate, which is the API layer. It has Prometheus all built in and the Grafana all built in. Right. So it's, it's, a, it's a level above the CAS operator. It's giving you all of these things in this whole suite of tools. And all you have to do is change, make one change, make one change in this Helm, Helm chart to make an update, right? So yeah, go ahead. Yeah, quick question. Um, so if, I'm, if I was gonna like do a production a Cassandra cluster, I'm worried about long-term, you know, is it gonna be something I could use? Um, um, with Helm charts, how much are you get, do you get locked in? Like if I use Kate, San, Kate Sandra and later on it's like, oh, Kate Sandra dies because things are changing so fast and everything. How much am I locked into whatever Helm chart um, I use? Well, well, Kate Sandra is a Helm chart. Right. Which is using Kubernetes, which is using containers and it's using CAS operator. I think the question you have to ask is, if I use CAS operator, how much am I locked in? Right? Is that your question? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, that that'd be be like a that'd be part of it. Well, well, you know, how much I locked into the CAS operator? How much I locked into all the configuration that the Helm chart adds on top of that? Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, if I were to like do an outline of like a hierarchy, right? So you kind of like have to see the full hierarchy to understand um, where you get locked in. <laughs> You get locked in everywhere, basically. So you have your Kubernetes, right? And then you have your Docker. So in this case, you have your Cassandra image, right? This is where if you don't customize it, you're locked into this. So if you're using a Cassandra image that somebody else has built and you're gonna continue upgrading using that path, then you probably don't wanna customize this, right? You wanna continue using their upgrade path because they're gonna have the same configuration structure. So that's one level of lock-in, right? Lock-in. Um, but you can always split from this and make like your own Cassandra custom image, right? Now in Kubernetes, um, we can just run Cassandra using like a, you know, a deployment, a stateful set. Um, you can use, you can use either of these, right? So there's no lock-in because this is pure Kubernetes, right? Sorry. Stateful set, this could be Cassandra image, this could be Cassandra custom image, right? It doesn't matter. Right, now, now the question is, well, what, what if I use Helm? So Helm is down here. Somewhere in the middle is your CAS operator, which is called Cassandra data center, right? But even in this, you can tell it which image to use as long as it has some um, semblance of the entry points and environment variables that the one that they use has, right? That's all it needs to do. Um, but at this point, if you are using this scheme, okay, your operator is also managing your persistent volumes. I mean, it's all there. But like to, to rip this out and replace it, that's like 
hey, I want to move from AWS to Amazon uh, to Azure. Well, you kind of have to like start fresh. So, but there's ways around it, right? So what you could do is like if you if you make your own, you know, um, my own Cassandra data center, right? And you have your Cassandra image, custom image two, right? You could do this, but you'd have to do a lot of wiring and networking to make sure that this data center joins this other data center and it replicates the data. So then you can migrate your data using, you know, internal Cassandra protocol. So the Cassandra protocol is always going to be the same, right? Hopefully. Um, does that make sense? Yep, that's helpful. And then the helm is just another layer on top of that. Yeah, so like, the helm is I mean, was, yeah. exactly the helm is doing this for you, right? Okay. So you can do, was, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I was just looking at like, the helm repos, and I know it's not the same thing as GitHub. You know, if like if I had a GitHub depend, if there's a dependency for like you know Python or whatever, and they had like two stars, I'd be a little bit hesitant, right? And all the helm charts have got like zero or the most had like ten stars or something, you know? Yeah. But, but the thing is, again, the Helm chart is a file. It's an open source file that either uses pure Kubernetes, like stuff like stateful set, or it uses a CRD, which a CRD has to be by virtue open. Like you saw the operator that, it, that we installed, right? It's one file. Um, but there are operators that have some compiled code. But at, at the end of the day, like you're, you have 100% visibility when you're using Kubernetes. Like, it's, it's very simple, okay? Kubernetes is two things, right? It's etcd storing the state of the cluster. However you define it, it's all these YAML files, right? And it's kubelet running and catching up to the state. And QProxy connects shit together. All right, it's very simple. So as long as it's eventually coming down to this, everything is manageable. It's just data. But the question is, how do you want to manage the data? You want to do it at the high level, right? Or you want to do it at, at this level? And the, <laughs> it's, it's funny you ask that question. It's like, well, why, why would I learn all this stuff? It's like, well, if you, if you start using Laravel, which is a PHP framework, and you've never done PHP, right? You can't really truly appreciate what Laravel is, first of all. But second of all, like if you have to really get into the nitty gritties of like doing some PHP coding and you don't know what's happening, you're screwed, you know? Or like, it's like, what's another equivalent? Um, like Django or Flask. Like, do you really wanna like bake your own, you know? API middleware engine, or would you, or like ex, 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 express and node, right? Do you want to build your own HTTP server to do get and post requests or do, are you just okay with using express? So that's kind of like the equivalent. Um, but I, I almost think the helm is like, it's like, um, it's just like a, <laughs> it's an automation to an automation um, that makes it a little bit easier to deploy. That's it. Cool. Uh, other questions? By the way, I'm gonna copy and paste this into my notes so it goes into the, <laughs> it eventually goes into the, uh, the blog post. Make sure I don't lose it. I know how Notepad is. It doesn't care for server crashes. All right. Well, uh, if there aren't any questions or comments, um, we can call it a day and we'll see you guys next week. Same time, same place. Take it easy folks. See you soon.